Hey guys, welcome back to another sample test breakdown. Today we're gonna to be doing the third passage in the psych Soch section. Let's go. So fair warning here, a lot of times I don't flow chart very much on psych Soch passages. They're a lot of times just real quick and um, I just wanna let you know in case I don't write that much down. An influential 1962 article provided the impetus for studying child abuse diagnosis and prevention in medicine by asking a sample of hospitals to report suspected cases seen over the course of a year. The authors were among the first uh, researchers to collect data on the incidence of child abuse. The article's lead author, C.H. Kemp, also led efforts for expanding child welfare laws. At the time, child abuse often went unrecognized for various reasons. For instance, physicians were not trained to look for evidence of abuse. The symptoms of abuse can be hard to interpret, and some parents misled physicians about the child's injuries. By the late 1960s, every state in the United States had passed legislation mandating that physicians report suspected abuse to child protection agencies. This is... <laughs> This is a really random like passage. Like it's just very kind of different, I guess, than a lot of MCAT passages. I haven't written anything down on my flow chart so far. Nothing has been confusing. It's just kind of been like a story. Um, since the 1960s, research on child maltreatment, which includes child abuse, neglect, and sexual abuse, has increased steadily to the point where hundreds of peer-reviewed articles are published on the subject each year. For example, recent research has documented the long-term consequences in adults of maltreatment during childhood. The possible adverse outcomes include heart and liver disease, depression, anxiety, alcohol and drug abuse, unemployment, and unintended pregnancy. Despite common perceptions, research on incidence rates show that the problem of child maltreatment cuts across all demographic groups. Increasing knowledge about child maltreatment has also been instrumental in the development of the pediatric subspecialty of child abuse pediatrics. Again, kind of just like more like words. It's there's no experiment or anything that I can like flow chart on. Despite advances in research, uh, in research, addressing child maltreatment is still a sensitive and controversial topic. The question that Kim and his colleagues raised in 1962 over what role medicine should play in addressing the problem and what should be left to other social institutions continues to be debated. As these debates carry on, some advocates have argued that social and cultural awareness of child abuse prevention remains behind the medical technologies available for child abuse diagnosis. I did not flow chart a single thing on that. It's like very, it's giving cars. Like I feel like I should be like, have a main idea or something now. Um, I mean, it's an article talking about child abuse and maltreatment and kind of how it's been researched over the years and medicine's role in it. There's, there's nothing to flowchart here. If you guys can find something, that's great, but um, I didn't. It's just very short. Uh, the first question, number 10, says, As described in the passage, the long-term consequences of child maltreatment have been found to include all of the following outcomes, except... So again, it's an except question, so however you choose to do that. Some people like underline it or highlight the word except. I tend to just say, okay, I'm looking for the ones that, um, you know, do include that outcome and then i'm going to mark those off uh just looking at the answer choices it says like chronic disease mood disorders personality disorders so i think it's talking about the this sentence right here um the possible adverse outcomes include heart liver disease depression anxiety alcohol drug abuse unemployment and unintended pregnancy so i think i'm really just supposed to kind of go through all of those outcomes and and uh kind of match them up to the answer choices so um, chronic diseases, you know, heart and liver disease would certainly be chronic, so that would be included. Um, mood disorders, so those are all the different types of depression, all the different types of anxiety and bipolar disorder. Um, so it did mention depression and anxiety. Chronic stress, that's a real vague term. That could be many things, but certainly unemployment would be a chronic stress. Um, unintended pregnancy maybe could be a chronic stress. Um, it would definitely be for me. So um, definitely chronic stress would be included personality disorders. So usually personality disorders are going to have 
like yada, 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 personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so none of those are listed up there. Depression and anxiety, they're psychopathology, but they are not personality disorders. They're mood disorders. So that one would not be included in these outcomes. Cut across demographic groups contradicts the perception that child maltreatment is subject to. So um, it's saying that incidence rates cut across demographic groups. I'm trying to like simplify it down a little bit. That's basically just saying that all demographic groups have child maltreatment within them like no no demographic group is spared of certain individuals mistreating children i guess is a good way to put it um so that contradicts the perception that child abuse is higher in one demographic over another whatever that may be um so contradicts the perception that child maltreatment is subject to social reproduction that's not really what I'm looking for. Institutional dim- discrimination. Um, no. Social stratification. Yes. That's kind of what I was saying. Like, um, social stratification is like the way that society kind of breaks up its um, citizens into groups based on demographics or class. Or um, there's a lot of other ways to kind of stratify a society. Um, but this one would be considering demographic stratification and so that would be um that would contradict the perception that child maltreatment is subject to social stratification and cultural relativism no if you guys don't know um the definition for the other three answer choices here highly recommend you go you know google it or uh watch a Khan academy video or something because those are all um definitions that you're going to want to know for the MCAT. Okay, number 12 says which piece of information from the passage is least relevant for determining the possible influence of confirmation bias on child abuse diagnosis? So I hate this question and mostly because it trips students up and a lot of times I have learned that it's because students have it a little bit backwards what what confirmation bias means. So Just a real quick recap, confirmation bias is um, the bias that we have to only pay attention to information that confirms what we already believe. So in this case, if there's a confirmation bias on child abuse, that could be either way. That could be, oh, I'm only paying attention to information that confirms that this child is being abused, or I'm only paying attention to... Um, information that confirms this child is not being abused. What is different between those two scenarios is what I come in believing. Like it's the preconceived belief that I have uh, before I get any more information to confirm um, my prior beliefs. So um, in this case, we don't know, like, you know, it's kind of considering a child abuse diagnostician. So some kind of provider of sorts is what it sounds like. Um, whether that be a doctor or what. So we don't know like what kind of belief that doctor is going to come into the room having. Do is, it, is he going to believe that this child is not being abused or is being abused? And is he going to pay attention to information that, that confirms that the child is being abused or is not being abused? Basically, we're trying to find information that could be useful um, in confirming a provider's preconceived notion about child abuse it's a very vague like question and i i don't like it because you have to kind of think of your own scenarios but we're gonna try it Um, let's start from the bottom actually d says emotional sensitivities around child abuse as a subject so certainly if you know the doctor uh or or even the patient i guess um has an emotional sensitivity to you know child abuse as a subject like probably a lot of people do um then that could play a role in kind of what he you know what he cares about what if he like is really sensitive to it or something and he sees a bruise on a child and he's like oh my god it's child abuse you know and really the kid just fell off a trampoline so that could play into confirmation bias in that way that's the scenario i've created over the course of trying to teach this question to many students c challenges posed by interpreting child abuse symptoms 
So that could definitely write because imagine a, an opposite scenario where a doctor walks into the room, sees that a child has a bruise on them. That bruise, like the symptoms of child abuse are very vague, I guess. I think it said that in the passage. So like that bruise could be just the kid falling off the trampoline or it could be his mom beating him. So we don't really know. That's a challenge posed by interpreting child abuse symptoms. And that could play into, you know, the doctor comes in the room and they're like, oh, it's just a bruise. The kid just fell down or something. And so that would confirm his preconceived notion that this child was not being abused. B says physician attention to evidence of child abuse. So already how much attention he or she pays to the child's symptoms of child abuse or whatever, um, that's already playing into, do you believe this child is going to be abused or not? Like, do you have a preconceived notion that this child is going to be abused or not? That's probably already going to kind of play into how much attention you pay and then how much attention you pay is going to pay in, play into um, what what you eventually decide as to whether or not the child's being abused. A says parental concealment of child abuse from physicians. And this is the right answer. And let me tell you why it's because the parent is not the diagnostician. So the parent's not the one that we're worried about their confirmation bias. And so them concealing information from the physician, the, phys the physician's probably just like, not even aware that any information is being concealed from him or her. And so concealment of information cannot play into your preconceived ideas of whether a child is being abused or not. Only like the additional information or things that are going on within your own head can uh, play into confirmation bias. It really all comes down to, is this something that's kind of within the diagnostician's head or the provider's head, um, which those things kind of could play into confirmation bias, or is this something that's um, like parental concealment, which is more like a social interaction type thing. Question 13 says, which development from the passage best illustrates an organizational change in the context of child abuse diagnosis and prevention. Okay, so we're trying to find an organizational change in child abuse diagnosis and prevention. A, the addition of a pediatric subspecialty in child abuse pediatrics. Um, so that would certainly probably help child abuse diagnosis and prevention, like you know, if they're, if people are more trained, these, these child, these pediatricians, if they're more trained in, you know, detecting abuse and, and helping abuse and helping the victims of abuse, um, then that probably would help. And that I would consider that an organizational change, you know, it's probably going to be like the American board of pediatricians or something like that. Um, I just made that up, but it's probably going to be some large organization that kind of makes that change. So I like answer A. Um, B says the increase in research on child abuse since the influential 1962 article. So that's not necessarily an organizational change because, you know, no one is kind of telling these people that they have to research that. It's kind of just like the, the trend in research, I guess, um, that people want to write more about this subject. They, they find that there's a lot of gaps in knowledge in this subject and they want to write more about it. So that's not really an organizational change. C says the passage of state laws in the 1960s that mandate child abuse reporting. So I would agree that this would probably help with child abuse um, diagnosis and prevention, but I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you what the AAMC says. They say that a law is not like an organization. I would have thought the government would be like an organization, but that's not what the AAMC says. Therefore, that's what I'm going to tell you guys. The government is apparently not an organization. So um, that'd be a little more overarching than a single organization. D, the continued debate over how to understand the problem of child abuse. Certainly a debate is not an organizational change and it also doesn't really help child abuse diagnosis and prevention. So the answer here is gonna be A.
So there's your breakdown guys. I hope that you, uh, you know, took something from it. If you liked it, please leave a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button so that you can see more of these in the future. If you didn't like it, leave a comment and tell us why not. All right. See you later.